Well, a good afternoon to those of you who are on the East Coast and good morning to those of you who are on the West Coast. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Reed Freeman and I'm a partner in the uh, Privacy and E-Commerce Group at uh, Venable in the Washington DC office. Uh, we are uh, uh, doing a webinar today on the Federal Trade Commission's uh, Commercial Surveillance and Data Security Rulemaking, uh, the long and winding road toward a new federal privacy and data security rule. <clears throat> this is an important topic uh, because the Federal Trade Commission is uh, wading into the area of rulemaking and rulemaking with respect to privacy and data security uh, for the first time, and what they have uh, suggested in the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking we'll discuss today uh, is a broad range of topics that could have a significant effect on businesses and the economy. Uh, my name, uh, the the uh, couple of housekeeping measure, uh, uh, measures. First of all, uh, please submit your questions using the chat feature. I will uh, try to respond to your questions uh, towards the end of our time together today. Uh, and if not, I'll try to, to get back to you separately. Also, in the course of this presentation, I will provide the CLE uh, keyword. That is the word that you will need to uh, take down and enter on the CLE form that you'll receive uh, uh, sometime next week uh, by email. So when I mention the CLE keyword, uh, please write that word down and save it in a place that you can access to put down on your form. So let's uh, jump in. Uh, first, let's uh, look at the agenda for what we're gonna cover today. Uh, so we're gonna begin with a look at the current federal trade commissioners. Then we're going to do a summary of the advance notice of proposed rulemaking that uh, is titled uh, Commercial Surveillance and Data Security. Uh, and uh, for, for uh, purposes of this webinar, for the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, I'll use the acronym ANPR. Next, we'll uh, talk about why did the uh, commission uh, issue this proposed rulemaking? Uh, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. What exactly is the FTC trying to accomplish? Uh, how does the AMPR affect federal and state legislative efforts to regulate uh, or to legislate in the privacy and data security arena? What is the process the Federal Trade Commission must go through under Section 18 of the FTC Act to promulgate a new trade regulation rule? Uh, how long does the rulemaking process take? at the FTC, and how do you or your business or trade association engage with the FTC in the course of this rulemaking proceeding? So let's jump into a, a look at the uh, FTC commissioners. Beginning with the chair, Lena Khan. Uh, Lena Khan was sworn in as a chair of the Federal Trade Commission on June 15th, 2021. Uh, prior to that, as she was an associate professor at Columbia Law School. She previously served as counsel uh, to the U.S. House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law, legal advisor to Federal Trade Commissioner Rohit Chopra, now the uh, director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and also as a legal director at the Open Markets Institute. While at the University of Columbia uh, School of Law, she co-authored a paper. This is a uh, uh, useful background, I think. Uh, she and her co-author said it was implausible that a big tech company that makes money from online behavioral advertising could ever put users' privacy first. I think it's useful to quote this in full. As long as such companies make most of their money through personally targeted advertisements, they'll be economically motivated to extract as much data from their users as they can a motivation that runs head first into users' privacy interests as well as any interests users might have in exercising behavioral autonomy or ensuring that their personal data is not stolen, sold, mined, or otherwise monetized down the line. I think this gives you a, 
a glimpse into the mindset of uh, Chair Khan as she was entering into her term, you know, before prior to entering into her term as a Federal Trade Commissioner and Chair. Rebecca Kelly Slaughter was sworn in on May 2nd, 2018. Uh, she is also a Democrat, like Chair Khan. Uh, it's, I think, worthwhile to note that each one of these commissioners uh, serves a, a term of seven years unless they were confirmed to fill an existing term of, of, a, of a commissioner who uh, departed. Uh, so Rebecca Slaughter is the, uh, the second of three Democrats on the commission, and she is the intellectual architect of the ANPR we're discussing today having proposed the use of the, the Federal Trade Commission's Section 18, of the 18, Section 18 of the FTC Act, authority to promulgate a privacy and data security rule in a 2019 speech at Silicon Flatirons and, at a, and in a 2021 Law Review article uh, that she co-published with Janice Kopech and Mohammed Batal. She was the uh, acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission uh, previous to the existing chair being appointed and confirmed. Alvaro Bedoya uh, is the third, uh, the third Democrat making the, the majority of the FTC a Democratic majority. Now, the FTC consists of five commissioners, three of whom are in the president's party and two of whom are in the opposition party. So the, we have a Democratic president and we therefore have three out of five Federal Trade Commissioners enough to form a majority and conduct the commission's business. Also note that historically, the Federal Trade Commission has operated in a bipartisan way. Many, many votes uh, at the FTC have been five to zero, and dissents have been rare, and when they have been made, they've been on very specific issues uh, historically. Uh, and so the FTC has not been a uh, a, much of a political place in the past uh, uh, 25 years or so, and uh, but with with uh, with this FTC, we're starting to see a lot of votes that are three to two, particularly in uh, uh, in in hot button issues like privacy. So, uh, uh, Commissioner Bedoya was sworn in on May 16th, 2022. Upon taking his seat, there was a three to two majority for the Democrats. He's the founding director of the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown University and has extensive experience on tech privacy issues. He's previously served as a chief counsel in the, in the Congress, where he focused on mobile location privacy and biometrics. His interests have tended to revolve in the privacy area, have tended to revolve around uh, biometrics, uh, algorithmic fairness, uh, geolocation, children's privacy, and also with respect to online fraud. The uh, two Republicans on the commission uh, begin with uh, uh, Noah Phillips. Noah Phillips was confirmed to the commission on April 26, 2018. Uh, he just announced this August that he's stepping down upon the nomination of his replacement, who will be another Republican. Uh, so that, that replacement has not been named. We don't know uh, for sure who it will be. But we do. Uh, it should be. It will be a a Republican. Uh, he uh, he also uh, served as chief counsel uh, in the Congress, and uh, he we put a quote in here uh, when asked how regulators should uh, handle uh, innovative technology uh, and and its regulation and uh, and um, legislation or regulation. He said uh, only if necessary, and then very carefully. So he urges a light regulatory uh, touch. He has expressed significant concerns, as we'll talk about today, on the breadth of the ANPR we're discussing. And together with Commissioner Wilson, uh, has um, uh, cautioned on the potential implications uh, for what they see as an overreach by the, by the FTC and what the, the dangers to the Federal Trade Commission itself in, the, in connection with an overreach uh, based on history, the history of the commission. We'll talk more about that later, but there is, there is some uh, precedent for, um, for uh, response to uh, congressional response to what's perceived as a Federal Trade Commission overreach and regulation. Next uh, 
Christine Wilson, uh, who is the, the second of two Republicans. Uh, uh, Commissioner Wilson was sworn in on September 26, 2018. Uh, she previously served uh, at, at the Federal Trade Commission as Chairman Tim Muris's chief of staff during the George W. Bush administration. Uh, she is a, uh, like all the other commissioners, she is an advocate of uh, federal privacy legislation, but like uh, Commissioner Phillips, the other Republican voted against the release of this uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking. In fact, she and Commissioner Phillips both uh, issued an unusually strong dissent to the publication of the uh, ANPR, uh, and, and we'll talk more about those in a moment. Okay, uh, on to substance. The, uh, you don't normally start a, uh, a webinar on uh, the FTC's mission statement, but I think this is significant. The, uh, the current mission statement of the Federal Trade Commission, which was released uh, at the end of August of this year, uh, says uh, that the, the Federal Trade Commission's mission is protecting the public from deceptive or unfair business practices and from unfair methods of competition through law enforcement, advocacy, research, and education. Uh, the public is new. Uh, previously, uh, the mission statement talked about protecting consumers from these, uh, from these uh, arms. The, the use of the word public, the change from consumers to public, uh, pulls in a broader range of focus for the Federal Trade Commission, potentially including employees and students, uh, something we're going to see reflected in the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Okay, let's move on to a summary of the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. And first, uh, let's get, get some background. In July 2021, President Biden issued Executive Order 14036, urging the Federal Trade Commission to exercise its rulemaking authority under Section 18 of the Federal Trade Commission Act to address unfair data collection and surveillance practices, in quotes. Also in July 2021, the Federal Trade Commission uh, voted out updates to its rules of practice in 16 CFR Part 1. Uh, these changes also are as these changes by a vote of three to two along party lines, which is an unusual. It's unusual to have a, uh, a dissent uh, or to vote no votes to a change of the rules of practice. And uh, nevertheless, there it was a three to two along party lines to what the majority described as a streamlining of Section 8, 18, the Commission Section 18 rulemaking process. Uh, it um, this uh, happened uh, just uh, over a year before the Federal Trade Commission released the uh, privacy uh, ANPR that we're talking about today. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, one of the Republicans, uh, criticized the changes in her dissenting statement, arguing that they uh, pared down procedural safeguards imposed by Congress, uh, limited independence of the chief presiding officer because that that person is now appointed by the chair, uh, reduced opportunities for public input from what used to be the case. We'll talk about that uh, a little later. Uh, and I did away with the, uh, the FTC staff report, which was required in the connection with a rulemaking proceeding and which was uh, supposed to highlight issues and uh, formulate recommendations based on the rulemaking record. With respect to the ANPR itself, uh, the the commission voted on, or the commission uh, published on August 11th, 2022, uh, the ANPR on commercial surveillance and data security. Uh, the ANPR broadly defines commercial surveillance as the collection, aggregation, analysis, regulation, transfer, or monetization of consumer. Uh, data and the direct derivatives of that information. Now, uh, language is important here. Uh, commercial uh, data collection is now referred to by the FTC majority as commercial surveillance, which I think even when considered objectively has to be seen 
as having negative connotations uh, for commercial data collection and use. Indeed, at the uh, FTC's September 8th public forum, which we'll talk about, uh, industry representatives pointed this out and urged the FTC to allow for the responsible use of data in any rule that it ultimately adopts. On the other hand, advocates applauded the FTC for undertaking this rulemaking proceeding and urged it to address what they see as, uh, as uh, in unfair and deceptive acts or practices involving data. Uh, let's see. Uh, so then uh, the the FTC relies on uh, its, its Section 18 rulemaking. It's called Magnuson Moss from the, uh, uh, from the that was the name of the, the act that imposed this rulemaking framework on the FTC. Um, uh, so publishing the advance notice of proposed rulemaking uh, was the first uh, procedural step in the course of the process of adopting a new rule. Uh, so now, as we'll talk about, Magnuson Moss rulemaking authority imposes significant substantive and procedural requirements on the FTC. And the FTC has rarely used this uh, authority to pursue rulemaking activities in the roughly 50 years since Congress granted the commission with this authority. Uh, the, the AMPR was then subsequently, after it was uh, released on August the 11th, it was subsequently published in the Federal Register on August 22nd. 2022, uh, meaning that um, in its comment period, the uh, written comments will be accepted uh, at the commission until uh, October 21st, 2022. Okay, let's uh, go with a an overview of the ANPR. Let's see here. Oh, backwards. There we go. All right. So uh, uh, section one of the ANPR uh, provides a general overview of the commission's rationale for commencing the rulemaking. Uh, specifically, the commission explains that it's considering the need for rules regarding commercial surveillance and lax security practices. These are quotes through the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. It says that its aim in issuing the ANPR is to generate a public record about relevant practices that are unfair or deceptive uh, and the uh, potential regulatory responses to those. Uh, the commission states in the ANPR that rules reflecting uh, so-called current realities may be needed to protect Americans from unfair or deceptive acts or practices regarding their data. Uh, the commission also argues that new rules would create a greater sense of predictability for companies and consumers compared to Enforcement Act, the case-by-case the -case enforcement regime that the commission has historically undergone with respect to privacy and data security. According, according to the mission, commission, it also issued the AMPR because recent commission actions, news reporting, and public research suggest that so-called commercial surveillance and lax security practices are apparent, allegedly prevalent and unavoidable. In particular, the commission highlights various concerns relating to data collection and monetization, information asymmetries, and increased harms to consumers. Now, these are these are allegations uh, suggested in the ANPR, uh, which for which the commission will need to build a record if it wants to pursue a rule any further than this. For data collection and monetization, uh, the uh, commission uh, says in the AMPR that Americans must uh, so-called, uh, quotes, surrender their personal information to companies in order to engage in modern life. The commission says that elaborate, the elaborate and lucrative market, it says, for the processing and sale of personal information incentivizes companies to develop and market products uh, to participate in this market. And the AMPR claims that companies misrepresent the purpose of the collection of consumer data to consumers, uh, adding that companies monetize this information uh, and apparently in an unfair or deceptive way. Um, the, uh, with respect to information asymmetries, the commission ANPR says that consumer consent and uh, permission may not always be meaningful and informed. Consumer consent and permission may not always be meaningful and informed. It says that uh, consumers cannot make informed decisions about using a service without meaningful access to information about privacy practices. Uh, the commission also describes an in 
information asymmetries between companies and consumers related to how companies use information collected about consumers. For harms to consumers, the AMPR cites various potential harms to, harms to consumers related to data collection and use, including uh, uh, suggestions that collection and use of data can affect consumers' wallets, safety, even their mental health. Additionally, the, consumer, the commission notes that uh, uh, and alleges that companies' growing reliance on automated systems creates new mechanisms and forms of discrimination. The commission also states that the uh, alleged material harms of commercial surveillance practices may be substantial uh, because they could increase the risk of cyber attacks by bad actors. The uh, commission's authority uh, the, uh, is, is uh, discussed in section two of the AMPR, uh, where the commission uh, uh, states that uh, Congress authorized the FTC through section 18 of the FTC Act uh, to propose a rule defining unfair and deceptive acts or practices with specificity when the commission has reason to believe that the unfair or deceptive acts or practices which are subject to the proposed rule are prevalent. So. The FTC uh, may uh, may uh, go forth and promulgating a new rule uh, when it uh, finds that there is an unfair or deceptive act or practice that is prevalent. Uh, in in order to do that, uh, the commission uh, can rely on the basis of its prior cease and desist orders, uh, or use any other information indicating a widespread pattern of unfair and deceptive acts or practices. As noted in the dissents that we'll talk about uh, in the, with respect to the release of this ANPR, uh, the, the FTC lists a number of law enforcement actions it's taken, uh, but those law enforcement actions don't line up with the issues raised in the ANPR for potential for comment and potential regulation. In other words, many of the practices as pointed out by Commissioner Phillips are listed in the ANPR for comment and potential regulation have never been held by the FTC to be unfair or deceptive. And this includes a targeted advertising in general. Um, so this, this um, uh, the, the, the ANPR also summarizes um, uh, the uh, also discusses the broad language of the of its statute applied to specific practices through enforcement actions and the promulgation of rules. Um, so uh, it also this section of the advanced notice proposed rulemaking does not address the fact uh, that the FTC has scarcely relied on its Section 18 authority, nor that uh, previous administrations have not attempted to draft rules related to privacy and data security without specific congressional authority enacted um, but without special specific congressional authority. The um, commission's current uh, uh, let, let, let's pause for a minute. So we talked about the FTC in order to uh, uh, Engage in a um, in a, uh, a rulemaking um, must find a practice is unfair or deceptive. Uh, practice is unfair uh, in uh, in violation of the Federal Trade Commission Act uh, when uh, it causes or is likely to cause substantial consumer injury, which consumers cannot reasonably avoid and which is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. A to practice is deceptive uh, if it uh, misleads or is likely to mislead a reasonable consumer, uh, a consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances uh, where that misleading practice representation or omission is material. The, um, the commission's current approach to privacy and data security. Um, section three of the ANPR provides background on the FTC's enforcement history, uh, which we talked about. Um, the, uh, the 
ANPR summarizes remedies the FTC has obtained in such enforcement actions, including prohibitions on selling of surveillance products, requiring comprehensive privacy programs, and requiring deletion of information, among other remedies. Uh, while the ANPR recognizes the Commission's enforcement history, the Commission explains that its enforcement experience suggests that enforcement alone without rulemaking may be insufficient to protect consumers from com significant harms. The Commission cites three uh, reasons for issuing this rulemaking. First, there are limited remedies under the FTC Act, which the Commission explains may affect their ability to defer future, deter future conduct. The Commission notably cites its general inability to obtain monetary relief in, in the first instance in enforcement actions, which the Supreme Court uh, took away from the FTC in AMG Capital Management versus FTC in 2021. So to, to recap, the Federal Trade Commission was previously able to get monetary relief as a remedy for unfair, for practices it alleges are unfair or deceptive in law enforcement actions under Section 5. They could get monetary relief, whether it was uh, um, restitution, disgorgement, so forth. They could, they could get that. The Supreme Court took it away. So now the Federal Trade Commission in their Section 5 enforcement program cannot get monetary remedies. And the FTC now thinks, the, the majority thinks, that their ability uh, to uh, deter future conduct is limited because its enforcement is only limited to injunctive relief and can't get monetary harms. On the other hand, the Supreme Court did not take away the FTC's authority to get civil penalties for either a violation of an existing order or a violation of a trade regulation rule. So if the FTC issues a trade regulation rule and there's a violation of it, the FTC can get civil penalties uh, for a violation of the rule. So if they have a rule uh, on privacy and they bring a privacy enforcement action, they'd be able to get civil penalties as well as an injunct injunctive relief. Uh, so that's significant for this FTC. Uh, second, uh, they, they uh, raised the alleged in inadequacies in their current remedies to, to provide consumer relief to address harm that has already occurred or is likely to occur. Uh, so they, they have a hard time with the past conduct. Uh, third, whereas they wouldn't with a rule. Uh, third, uh, difficulty in applying currently available forms of relief to, um, to conduct that does not lend itself to broadly accepted ways of quantifying harm where they don't cause direct financial injury uh, in in any individual case. So if they just have a rule, they can get civil penalties, whereas they don't have to show uh, uh, harm. And uh, they also uh, raise the difficulty in investigating practices on a case-by-case -case basis due to limited resources. Now, uh, nothing in particular happened to reduce the FTC's resources. And this was, if this is a problem, it's been a problem since the FTC began its privacy enforcement program uh, decades ago, uh, but now this FTC raises their limited resources and is and in pursuing matters on a case by case basis as a reason for doing this rule. Um, so, uh, so the, I got a question: At what stage of the process will the FTC have to make a broad determination that specific aspects of co commercial surveillance are unfair or deceptive? So they'll need to do that. Uh, in the course of the rulemaking, that, so the rulemakers will see the rulemaking involves an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, a proposed rule, and a final rule. And in each uh, phase of that, the FTC has, uh, well, in the, the ANPR and the uh, proposed rule, there are opportunities to comment. There's also opportunities for informal hearings, cross-examination, rebuttal testimony. Uh, that will all build a record, and the FTC's rule has to uh, look to the record to find which aspects of commercial surveillance are not only unfair or deceptive, but also prevalent uh, in the market. Another question, what legal review is possible once the FTC issues a rule? Uh, is this the stage at, at which major questions judicial review can occur? Great question. Uh, they're both great questions. The answer is, uh, sure, in, in a uh, judicial review of a rule, uh, uh, one argument can be that it uh, that the rule 
uh, involves a, a major question and no delegation of Congress to address that question. And a federal court can certainly uh, consider that. In fact, um, the dissents to issuing this rule, and certainly many of the comments at the public forum, uh, raise the specter of uh, of this uh, effort uh, butting against the major questions doctrine. So, great questions. Uh, keep them coming. Um, so, uh, the um, the ANPR uh, uh, seeks uh, uh, seeks public comment on a number of issues. Uh, it seeks comment on uh, the nature and prevalence of harmful commercial surveillance, the balance of costs and countervailing benefits of such practices, uh, and of any um, the question out of the way, and, and of any uh, potential trade regulation rules. So, the nature and prevalence, the balance of costs and countervailing benefits, and proposals for protecting consumers. Uh, this is all for purposes of building a a record. Uh, however. The uh, FTC states the ANPR uh, does uh, not encompass the full scope of potential regulatory interventions the commission may consider. And importantly, the commission invites input on rules in force in US states, in foreign jurisdictions, and otherwise. Uh, so the FTC is looking wherever it can for uh, information to put on the record to consider for purposes of potential tr potential uh, privacy and data security rule. Uh, that's significant because as we saw in the public forum, a number of uh, commenters, notably many in the advocacy community, uh, pointed to the uh, GDPR in Europe as a, uh, an appropriate regulatory framework for the FTC to consider, uh, particularly with respect to, among other things, uh, targeted advertising. Let me get to the next slide. Okay, um, the uh, the ANPR includes uh, ninety five questions uh, total, uh, grouping them into four categories for public comment. Uh, these include: uh, To what extent do commercial surveillance practices or lax uh, data security measures harm consumers? Uh, to what extent do commercial surveillance practices or lax data security measures harm children, including teenagers? Uh, how should the commission balance costs and benefits in the course of a rulemaking? And how, if at all, should the commission regulate harmful commercial surveillance or data security practices that are prevalent? Uh, so uh, the dissent points to uh, or at all as sort of a foregone conclusion uh, for regulation, we'll see, I guess, uh, but but certainly the FTC is looking for all input it can get. Um, so let's go down. Okay. Um, so the um, the topics addressed by questions in the ANPR uh, include. Um, uh, a number of uh, areas uh, for the FTC to, uh, to consider uh, with respect to uh, privacy rulemaking. Uh, first, broadly, questions regarding uh, surveillance of consumers. Second, questions regarding uh, data security. Uh, third, uh, questions uh, regarding privacy of children and teenagers. And then. Uh, questions regarding targeted advertising, biometrics, dark patterns, algorithmic decision making, civil rights, notice and consent frameworks, and employee monitoring. Um, with respect to data security, the uh, commission, uh, as noted in the dissent of Commissioner Phillips, uh, asks uh, just a handful of questions regarding data security. And as we saw in the public forum, uh, this this was uh, uh, surprising to panelists in the public forum because uh, they they felt like if there's if there's consensus on any part of this um, this uh, proceeding, uh, it would be on data security standards uh, th that you know that that are reasonable and and widely adopted. Uh, with respect to privacy of children and teenagers, um, the the criticism at the public forum and in the dissents 
was that the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act uh, uh, is a congressional um, uh, recognition that the the scope of uh, in, interest to be protected in a you know, for children are children uh, uh, under the age of 13. The uh, ANPR uh, goes to great lengths to ask questions about children and teens, including questions regarding what uh, protections, if any, should uh, ch should children who are not covered by COPPA uh, be granted. Uh, the the uh, the argument and against this line of questioning is that Congress already uh, delegated to the FTC rulemaking authority under COPPA, and that rulemaking authority is for uh, under 13s. And if Congress is going to, is you know, is if that should be expanded beyond the under 13s, it should be Congress, not the FTC, uh, who does it. Um, dark patterns are uh, practices on the internet that cause, uh, that are alleged to cause uh, consumers to pay money or to pay more money uh, than they intend to pay or to give up information or more information than they intend to give up. Uh, it is a way of manipulating the user interface uh, of, a, of a, a screen to uh, uh, trick consumers into doing what they don't intend to do or want to do. Uh, questions regarding alg algorithmic decision making uh, go to the potential for algorithmic bias, uh, which uh, could bleed into the next issue, civil rights, which is to cause uh, 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 discrimination or adverse impacts on protected classes. The dissent uh, noted that the FTC has never, well, first of all, the FTC Act doesn't use the word discrimination, and the FTC has never used the FTC Act um, in, in this way, and they don't really have the ex experience or expertise uh, to do this, and therefore, um, uh, that they shouldn't. Uh, notice and consent frameworks uh, uh, asks an entire line of questioning regarding uh, whether uh, the notice and consent framework that's been used uh, uh, so far, or you know, that they were all familiar with, is uh, an efficacious way of getting consent, uh, getting consumers agreement in a meaningful way uh, for the use of the collection and use of their personal information. Uh, the dissent notes that uh, this is paternalistic, and if people want to provide their personal information, they, they will give the authority, and if they don't, they won't. Uh, employee monitoring uh, goes to issues involving um, the tracking of employees while they work, and uh, the um, dissents note that um, the commission has never uh, gotten into the uh, aspects of the employer-employee relationship. Each of the commissioners issued a statement in connection with the um, with the ANPR being published. But first, uh, let me give the CLE uh, keyword for use in your forms. Um, I'm going to say this again. Right now, I'm going to give the CLE word to use to write down and then put on your forms when you receive them uh, by email. The CLE word is ANPR2022. That is A is in Apple, N is in Nancy, P is in Paul, R is in Reed, uh, 2022. ANPR 2022 is your CLE keyword. Um, uh, chair, chair of the FTC, Lena Khan, uh, issued a statement uh, where she said that the FTC's goal at this stage is to build a rich public record to inform whether the commission should pursue rulemaking and what form the rules should take. As she highlighted the importance of this process for documenting specific business practices and their prevalence, the magnitude and extent of the resulting consumer harm, the efficacy or shortcomings of rules pursued in other jurisdictions, and how to assess which area or areas are or are not fruitful for FTC rulemaking. So, Note in this statement, uh, she talks about the magnitude and extent of the resulting harms, which sort of presupposes that there are harms that need to be addressed by rulemaking. Um, and then uh, uh, how to assess which areas are or are not fruitful for FTC rulemaking. Well, in, in making the statement, which are or are not fruitful, it's, it sort of suggests that some are fruitful for FTC rulemaking. And um, the the dissent argues that uh, this is an area for Congress, not the FTC, uh, to pursue given the, the uh, 
very substantial trade-offs that need to be made um, in order to arrive at a privacy and data security rule. Um, she noted that Cherkan noted uh, several topics in the AMPR as areas for which she says she's eager to build a record. Uh, these include procedural protections versus substantive limits. Uh, uh, giving an example of the growing awareness of the limits of notice and consent and where bans or and prohibitions on certain data practices may be appropriate. Bans and prohibitions on certain data practices may be appropriate. Uh, she talks about the administrability, uh, including rules that uh, do not rely on determinations by that the FTC is not positioned to make very well or to police. Uh, uh, and uh, discrimination based, <clears throat> based on protected categories, uh, workplace surveillance, and business models and incentives, particularly models that she says incentivize persistent tracking and surveillance. So a number of areas in here uh, that... Um, that are, I think, core to the business community, that um, that uh, the chair is looking to build a robust public record on. You know, I might add that, you know, that she says, you're just trying to build a record here. Uh, well, I sort of feel like uh, if, you know, once you, once you go down the road of building a record and you get stakeholders involved in creating a record, uh, this is a road that's difficult to uh, get off uh, gracefully. Uh, for the FTC. So and it takes a long time to promulgate a rule and it takes uh, a lot of effort as we'll see. But uh, this is a road that's uh, uh, difficult for those who start it to stop it, I think. Um, um, uh, let's see, Commissioner Slaughter, let's talk about Commissioner Bedoya. Uh, Commissioner Bedoya uh, issued a statement also saying the ANPR is just asking questions and that the breadth of questions would generate diverse public comments to influence whether and how the commission proceeds with a, a notice of proposed rulemaking. The areas of, uh, of emphasis for Commissioner Bedoya in con connection with building a record uh, include uh, having the FTC focus on the needs of people who are most at risk of being left behind by new technology in the modern economy, and they include uh, emerging discrimination issues, the mental health of kids and teens, uh, the the NPR uh, cites to what they say is a record of um, of uh, uh, mental health effects, especially the kids and teens uh, uh, suffer by prolonged time uh, online and seeing harmful content. Uh, he goes on to say he wants comments on um, how to protect non-English speaking communities from abusive data practices and how to protect against unfair uh, uh, or deceptive practices related to biometrics, an area that is of, of, of real concern to Commissioner Medoya. Uh, Commissioner Slaughter uh, commented that the purpose of the rulemaking is to uh, review uh, harms systematically and, to, uh, uh, and the root of the unlawful activity that causes the harms and to memorialize that. Um, she mentioned data abuses, including surreptitious biometric or location tracking, discriminatory or unaccountable algorithmic decision-making. Uh, and she uh, discusses how largely unrestrained commercial data collection, retention, use, and sharing supports these practices. Um, she mentioned the following issues as highlights for her in building the record, including uh, data minimization and purpose and use specifications, civil rights, vulnerable populations, discriminatory algorithms, and kids and teens. Uh, again, the dissent notes that these are issues that uh, that uh, Congress is in a better position in than the Federal Trade Commission to uh, make the kind of trade-offs to develop a framework uh, of uh, of a rule which operates uh, substantially as a as a federal law. Um, moving on to uh, the dissents, uh, th th this is unusual. The 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 strident nature of these dissents, and in, in Commissioner Wilson's case, the ad hominem nature of the dissents is unusual for the FTC. Uh, Commissioner Phillips uh, uh, says in his dissenting statement, uh, it argues that the ANPR is just a, a quote, naked power grab, close quote, uh, by the majority. Uh, he says the ANPR does not meet the FTC Act's requirement to describe the area of inquiry, the commission's objective, or the regulatory alternatives. Uh, he says that it's... Um, is too vast and amorphous to develop a, a coherent record um, and is a, uh, uh, 
an effort by an unelected set of FTC commissioners as legislators, uh, uh, which uh, citing the Supreme Court's uh, uh, major questions decision in uh, uh, um, the West Virginia versus EPA, uh, um, which uh, uh, quotes from that, um, it, about the court's rejection of agencies asserting a uh, highly consequential power beyond what Congress could reasonably be understood to have granted. Uh, the, the reference to unelected FTC commissioners is a veiled reference to a, to a, uh, a well-known, um, really a debacle at the FTC uh, several decades ago, which still shadows the FTC to this day, involving uh, the regulation of advertising to children. Uh, it's it's uh, referred to in shorthand as KidVid for children's video advertising, where the FTC uh, sought uh, substantially to dramatically limit or even ban advertising to children um, uh, on the grounds that children were unable to discern uh, advertising or to, to, to understand it and um, and that it could have negative uh, health effects and other effects on children. Uh, when the FTC did that, uh, it was the culmination of a long line of FTC regulatory actions uh, that uh, um, had the business community frustrated. And um, the, the Congress as well, uh, Congress back then uh, killed the rulemaking proceeding at issue and uh, uh, let the FTC's funding lapse and the agency was without uh, funding for several days and had to shut down. Uh, in addition, the FTC didn't get their appropriation uh, reinstalled and, uh, for over a decade after the rulemaking was shut down. And, and a little later, the FTC was, um, was uh, shackled with this Rule 18 um, Magnuson Moss rulemaking authority as opposed to APA rulemaking authority, uh, with the new rulemaking authority being uh, uh, very cumbersome and protracted and uh, limiting the FTC on what it what it could do and how quickly uh, it could do it. Uh, so that that KidVid is a specter uh, that the FTC is uh, still living with uh, to this day, and uh, the the argument is um, that the FTC uh, in in doing that um, with in privacy, as Professor Huffnagel has noted, um, could have um, a deleterious effects on the uh, the FTC. Um, so, uh, so let's get into some of these uh, questions. Uh, why uh, uh, did the FTC uh, publish the ANPR and pursue this rulemaking? Um, well, um, first of all, uh, longstanding and persistent intent of the, the majority. Uh, remember, Commission Slaughter noted uh, that, that she's wanted to pursue uh, a privacy rulemaking since at least 2019 using Section 18. Uh, second, um, uh, the FTC now has the votes uh, with three to two majority. A third, they want to set a prophylactic rule uh, to prevent what they identify as harms with uh, data practices, not just to react to them. Um, in addition, uh, uh, they want to set a standard by rulemaking that would take a long time to establish through case-by-case -case enforcement. Um, and then, and then uh, and additionally, uh, as we've noted, they want another route to civil penalties in the first instance to get monetary relief and enforcement actions and uh, bringing enforcement actions on the basis of a rule violation um, allows the FTC to get civil penalties. Um, let's see, I'm going to remove that. Um, uh, so uh, what is the Federal Trade Mission Commission trying to accomplish? Um, they... Uh, Again, they want a, a prophylactic rule. Um, Chair Khan has noted uh, the growing uh, digitiz uh, let me this slide down. Uh, The growing digitization of, of the economy means that potentially unlawful practices may be prevalent and case-by-case -case enforcement failing adequately to deter lawbreaking or remedy the resulting harm. Um, uh, Commissioner Slaughter says it's up to the commission to use the tools Congress expressly gave us, however rusty we may be at wielding them, to prevent these unlawful practices. Uh, and that's why she's been calling for this for a long time. Uh, Commissioner Phillips, on the other hand, uh, somewhat memorably stated, it's impossible to discern from this sprawling document, the ANPR, which meanders in and out of the jurisdiction of the FTC and goes far afield from traditional data privacy and security, the number and scope of the rules the commission envisions. 
Um, so next, uh, how does the ANPR affect federal and state legislative efforts to regulate privacy and data security? Um, well, it, it may, it may, it, it's yet to be seen, I think, uh, despite uh, uh, sort of dire warnings by the dissent. Um, certainly, it's possible, as Commissioner Wilson stated, um, that um, the, the ANPR and the rulemaking proceeding may be used by opponents of the uh, ADPPA and, and other federal legislative efforts as a reason for not moving them any further. Um, now, the, as you know, the ADPPA has uh, passed a full committee of Congress, and it's the first uh, federal privacy bill uh, to do that, uh, and it, so it's progressed further in the legislative process than any other uh, comprehensive privacy uh, rules or proposals. Um, it, on the other hand, I think uh, it seems unlikely uh, that the FTC's ANPR um, is, is going to meaningfully affect uh, the the uh, laws and the regulatory efforts underway in uh, in California, Virginia, Colorado, Utah, Connecticut uh, um, that have passed. And I think it'll remain to be seen whether there'll be any effect on any other states' um, efforts. But but still, I think that uh, that seems unlikely to me at this stage. Okay, what's the process? Uh, the FTC must go through uh, to um, to promulgate a uh, uh, a trade regulation rule under Section 18 of the FTC Act. Okay. Uh, first, uh, there need to be uh, petitions uh, to commence trade regulation rule proceedings. Then, an advance notice. Oh, by the way, a, a, a business or organization. Uh, can petition the FTC to initiate a rulemaking proceeding, or the FTC can do so on its own uh, motion. Uh, the next step is the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. That's what we have now, and that uh, calls for uh, written comments, and as well as a there was a, uh, a public forum where oral oral comments were accepted from business and and adv advocacy interests as well as from individuals. Um, the next stage. Uh, is the commencement of a rulemaking proceeding. Uh, and when um, uh, commencing a rulemaking proceeding, the FTC has to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking, which has to be published in the Federal Register 30 days after it's been submitted to the, uh, to the Senate um, Commerce, Science, and Transportation uh, Committee and the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee. So there is congressional uh, oversight of this and, uh, and certainly... Uh, the opportunity for Congress to to weigh in. Uh, there are then comments on the notice of proposed rulemaking um, that uh, the, the, on that. Well, there, let me back up. There needs to be a notice of proposed rulemaking, as I discussed. The contents of the notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, when the FTC issues a proposed rule, it has to issue a statement uh, containing the text of the rule, any alternatives which the commission proposes to promulgate, a reference to the legal authority under which the rule is proposed, a statement describing the reason for the proposed rule, an invitation to comment, a, listed, a list of disputed issues of material fact identified by the commission, an explanation of the opportunity for an informed, informal hearing and instructions for submitting uh, um, uh, petitions to participate in the hearing, um, and how uh, the public can obtain copies of the preliminary regulatory analysis. So the, here's a notice of proposed rulemaking, a contents of the rule that we just discussed, and then the FTC has to issue a preliminary regulatory analysis with a concise statement uh, for the proposed rule and the, and the objectives of it, uh, reasonable alternatives to the rule, um, um, a preliminary analysis, uh, for each of the alternatives uh, and the projected benefits and adverse economic effects of it, then the FTC uh, must receive written comments on the proposed rule uh, and provide an opportunity for a hearing, an, in, uh, an informal hearing uh, where interested persons can uh, uh, petition to orally present to the commission. In addition, uh, the uh, uh, with a informal hearing, uh, there, uh, 
that there can be requests to conduct cross-examinations or present rebuttal submissions regarding disputed issues of material fact. Uh, then uh, there needs to be a final notice of the informal hearing after all the uh, petitions to participate and do cross-examination and present rebuttal to submissions. And uh, the FTC can designate group representatives of people with aligned interest to uh, engage in the cross-examination and rebuttal submissions. Uh, there's a presiding officer, which the FTC chair uh, is or appoints now under the amended rules for rulemaking. Um, and uh, when there are disputed issues of material fact, as we discussed, there can be cross-examination of the oral presentations and rebuttal submissions. There needs to be a written transcript uh, of that. And a, ultimately, a recommended decision will issue from the presiding officer on disputed issues of material fact. Uh, and then finally, there'll be a, a promulgation of the rule with a statement of basis and purpose and a final regulatory analysis and a rulemaking record created uh, that can, contains the, the rule and all the documents we discussed and the, and the transcripts created. Uh, now, if there are any communications to commissioners, which uh, tends to happen, or their staffs, uh, those have to be put on the uh, Sunshine Docket of the FTC uh, for others to see. There needs to be a verbatim transcript created and uh, uh, a memorandum that summarizes the, the basis of the meetings and who participated. Uh, winding down here, uh, how long does all this take? Well, I mean, there's no rule on how long it takes, uh, but in general, uh, I think we can expect this with all of the uh, requirements the FTC has to undertake. It is historically taken between five and seven years, uh, which means it could span up to three presidential terms, which means that if the FTC as composed wants to pursue this rulemaking uh, pr uh, proceeding, uh, uh, you would have to, uh, at least as, as constituted now, they would need to maintain a democratic majority uh, for that whole period to keep this going. I think if a Republican majority takes over, given the ANPR as it's written, uh, they they may not pursue it, uh, given the, the dissents by the Republicans. So the, this lengthy timeline could be dis disrupted based on electoral shifts and the commission's uh, um, composition. Uh, how to engage with the FTC. I just mentioned all the areas where the FTC um, uh, we'll seek comment and participation, uh, uh, written comment, uh, participation in or, uh, informal hearings, uh, and also to um, meetings with commissioners and their staffs and the uh, rules that go with that for transcripts and, um, and notification on the, on the Sunshine Docket so that all interested stakeholders can see uh, who has said what uh, in an effort to try to uh, affect the rulemaking proceeding. So uh, that's it uh, for the uh, presentation. Uh, and um, Tamara, I don't see uh, any additional uh, questions um, on, the, on the screen. Let me see if there's one. Um, any chance the results of this will help us get back to having a safe harbor? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, the, I don't think the FTC can, um, can uh, prescribe a, a new safe harbor program like there was uh, before. Um, we'll, I'd certainly, I don't think this FTC is likely to do that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it, it is possible that we get back to, to something like that. Um, but if we do, uh, you know, there are questions of whether and how uh, it needs to be constituted to uh, uh, survive scrutiny in the European Union. That's a good question. It's certainly not a question that's in the uh, 95 questions the FTC has asked. It's not something that I think is on, on their uh, uh, mind right now. And with that, we're at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific. I want to thank you again for your uh, participation in this webinar. I hope you found it useful. Um, now, uh, to wrap up, um, uh, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Tamara Jackson, Taylor Alcott, Jackie Williams, Morgan DePipa, and Kara Kane for helping make this possible today. Uh, and if I did not get it to one of your questions today, I'll try to do so uh, later by email. Again, you'll receive slides from today's presentation and a recording in coming days. And please remember the CLE keyword I provided. And thanks again. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.